Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, sir. Carrie Champion. Good morning. Good morning, you guys. Thanks for having me. I Good so morning. I appreciate it. I haven't been outside in forever, so this is a big deal. Sorry we had to put you through all the testing, and we just got to make sure that you you good. You good. No, yeah, I'm vax and wax. Let me, let me ask you a question that I ask everybody, especially after the pandemic. I want an honest answer. Okay. How are you? Ooh. That's a tough question. Um, it depends on the day. So mm -hmm. so I think everybody, and I had said this the other day, is some kind of trauma. Everybody's traumatized in some form or fashion. Absolutely. And you spend all this time in the house, so it's forcing all of us to to deal with shit. So for me, I am, are we allowed to curse? Yeah. yeah. Um, I am, I feel like I have really good days. Like if you want to say professionally, I'm great. I'm happy. I'm winning. All the things, right? Mm -hmm. All the things that you say you want. But personally, you just have to think about what matters and, and, and what you want your legacy to be and how you want to live your life. And so for me, no distractions has forced me to just slow down and, and think. So it's been it's been it's been hard, but it's mm -hmm. been good because everything you want is on the other side of hard. What did you learn about yourself during the pandemic that you didn't know? What did you what did you finally have to face, carry champion? I like to eat a lot, like I graze. I put on a lot of weight. Like a cow? Like a cow. You said graze. Just grazing, just mm. eating a lot, like okay. just a lot. But that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? No. Because be healthy. It depends why you're eating, though, because sometimes eating is a trauma a, response. I, well, I boredom. I was bored. Okay. I don't like to be bored. I don't like to be by myself. Um, but I do like being by myself. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Do you ever, because I know you, I know, I know for a fact you guys both deal with that. You're by yourself, but then you don't like being by yourself, but then you love being by yourself. Yeah. It's, it's just a, it's mm -hmm. this crazy response. You to, like to control when you're by yourself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Don't put me in self isolation. I don't want to be isolated. Mm -hmm. I, so mm -hmm. I, I thought that. And then I also thought I'm like the honestly like March March twenty when we shut down. I was in New York the week that New York shut down, and then like a few days later the NBA shut it down. So for people that was real when the mm -hmm. league was like we're all out. That was last year. That is true. That's when everybody was like, damn, this COVID thing might be real. Yeah, Are they stopping like, the money? Yeah, yeah. The money stopping? <laughs> yeah, no, really. This year was like, oh, okay, we're not playing no more? Okay, so it's serious. I remember thinking um, probably a few weeks after that, like I was like, I'm about to be um, alone by myself in my house with um, a lot of shoes. And that made me that made me really sad. You start thinking you want a, <laughs> you want a man. You're like, shit, I, need, I really I need a, a partner. Like, I want to go through life with somebody if I'm really about to be by myself. Mm -hmm. And then everybody I know who got a partner is like, no, you don't. No, you don't. Get out the house. A lot, of, the, a lot, of, a lot of divorces happened last a year. A lot, a lot of breakups. A lot of A lot of breakups. So we're, it's on, like, it's, so what happens is, is what you don't have, you think you want. But all this was, was just, I think for everybody, honestly, was a time for us to sit and feel who we are and what we need and how we function. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't want to do that. And mm -hmm. so I'm just sitting in it and I'm, and I'm embracing it. You have to embrace everything that's difficult. Like it hits your, in, in your mind, you know, you talk about mental health, you know, it's awareness. And so we're talking about my mental health. I was like, I don't like feeling like this. And mm -hmm. so I would try to medicate. Let me have some wine. Let me eat. Let me hang out with my homies. Let me talk on the phone. Let me FaceTime. And then at the end of the day, I was like, I just have to embrace whatever it is I'm feeling. Every bad thought, every good thought, just sit in it and love it and, 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 and hate it and like it. All of the things I felt like for me um, that's what I've been going through. It's still, it's still, you're still going through it. You so know besides I mean? the food and the, and the wine and the eating, what else did you say, you know what, I'm going to focus on this during this time? Because we've been stuck in the house for, what, a year? Longer. Thank you, white man. What is his name? Dan. <laughs> his name is Dan. <laughs> His name is Dan. Man, you must be really lonely. Uh, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> what is his name? Dan, is are, he you, single? are you dating? Are you dating? Okay. I'm going to try to holler. Um, no, I I think, I, and I also focus on just making money. This is a, so sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. I know people think don't talk about that, but I thought, I just was like, what do I want to do? What does it look like? So after I, I leave ESPN, I we have all these different opportunities, and I'm, and I'm just saying yes to everything because it sounds exciting, but now it's it really is more focused. Like, what do I'm gonna do? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna live my life? How how will I be able um, to give back? Because that I think mm -hmm. that's honestly what we all should be doing. Like, we have this platform, and if you're not doing anything for anybody else, then what the fuck are you doing? That's right, absolutely. So that was a real big focus for me. Um, and making sure that I was doing it authentically, like not 
you know, not doing it because I want people to see it, doing it because that's what I do, mm-hmm. like, just from my heart. So all of those things were, um, you know, the pandemic is, is crazy because you ask everybody how they're doing and they're just like, okay, we're doing, and thank God I didn't lose any close family members, but there were so many people who lost family members, that's right. friends. I knew like secu- people I used to work with, you know, a security guard that I know passed away. And I'm like, damn, this is real. And we are so consumed with other things, but there's been a significant loss of life. Um, and with that loss of life is so much trauma. And then I've been focused on, you know, look, you might as well call me Angela Davis 2.0. I've been I've been out here. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I really am dedicated to making sure that black women are taken care of, that we are, um, our voices are amplified, that I'm unapologetic in how I feel. Because I think for so long we've been so quiet, as you well know, especially in the workspace. And we don't talk about the realness of, an inappropriate comment or uh, all those microaggressions or, you know, and women like sexual harassment, you name it, the list goes on. We don't ever talk about it. And I don't do that anymore. I'm not making you comfortable to make me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, I I, I don't want to talk about what you are doing or done. I do. Whatever. But in the moment, I want to talk about you. Like nobody ever talked about Carrie Champion. Who Mm -hmm. is Carrie Champion? Where did Carrie Champion come from? What do you mean by that? Like who, Who are you? Where did you come from? My mom's... I know that, crazy. What you mean? Where? Where's your origins? So, as in, how'd I grow up? Because that is a very, very wide question. Or, and where where did you grow up? Okay. So, so I grew up in Pasadena, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, this has a lot to do with um, everyone teases me about my love for the Lakers or how I feel about sports. It's because I grew up in L.A., right? Mm-hmm. So, L.A. proper. Then my mom got this job. It was my mom. She raised me by herself. My dad wasn't in the picture till very late in life. Mm-hmm. And so we grew up in LA for a while. Then my mom got this job um, and we called it like the Jefferson. She was moving on up, right? She so was it hood, it. suburbs, what was it? It was a hood for a while. Like okay. we lived in West LA hood for a while. She got this really good job. Now you have to understand my mom, my mom grew up in the projects and she had a GED, barely mm-hmm. got a GED. A teacher took pity on her and it's like, fine, whatever, I'll help you out. Then she was always a talker. She could just talk her way into anything. Mm-hmm. And so my mom ended up getting this pretty good decent job for somebody with a, D, a GED and she was like we're gonna move to Pasadena because it's prettier there so just imagine a little girl from the project she grew up in literally in Watts and so she's like dang the Pasadena feels beautiful mm-hmm. you, you have to understand it's a whole nother world when you haven't seen anything so we moved to Pasadena I'm about 12 years old and if I and if I'm telling you the truth that's probably where um, everything that mattered how I formulated my thoughts, how I saw the world, it changed. Mm-hmm. Because for for a very long time, I grew up thinking you got pregnant at 18. Like, just because that's what you saw. That's all I saw. Yeah. Everybody got pregnant at 18. Everybody. My cousin was pregnant when she was 14. Uh, you, you know, and, you know. Then her mom made her get rid of the baby. And then she got pregnant again. And she was like, I'm having it. It was just, you know, I just always thought that was the case. And a, and a win for me and my family would be not being pregnant. Mm. Wow. And that was the win. The win wow. was like, don't get pregnant. Don't get pregnant. That's all I ever remember. That's... I was terrified, which had a lot to do with how I interacted with boys and what I couldn't do. Like all we, that's all my mom ever talked about. Don't get pregnant. Don't get pregnant. Um, and then it was, and once we got past a certain age, the conversation shifted to go to school, go to college, just mm-hmm. go to college. Mm-hmm. You know, all these are just simple wins. So I'm not asking for much. Um, and I think, I think that that has a lot to do with how I, I manifest and how I move. But you know, by obviously, if you look at it, I. For my mom, it was a win, right? I didn't have no kids, right? She's like, oh, that's so great. I'm so proud of you. And then you mm-hmm. graduate from college. Oh, that's so great. I'm so proud of you. But that was it. Her job was done. Like, literally, when I turned 18 and I was in a UCLA, she was like, I'm Bye. Bye. Exactly. <laughs> I did my job. Right. I can't do any more. And that's how a lot of, uh, how, I mean, I would think a lot of parents raise their children. I'm doing the best I can. And then but when you turn 18, I'm done. And that's all I did. And so... After that, I got to UCLA. I never looked back. Like, well, what I, sparked that? What sparked the seed to go to go to school, and especially someplace like UCLA? Well, look, um, here goes some some real stupid stuff. And what was your major in UCLA too? I majored in communications with the emphasis with. Uh, well, actually, I majored in English, if I'm honest. So I wrote pay, I wrote a lot, and uh, with the emphasis in communications, I already knew I was going to do this. Like I was going to be Oprah. When I saw mm-hmm. Oprah's little self on TV when I was like seven, I was like, okay, there you go. Mm-hmm. She looks like me. I want to do that. Mm-hmm. However. However, here's the funny part about going to school. 
um, I applied everywhere, and um, and I used to be in this program called Upper Bound. Shout out to Upper Bound. I don't know if you guys ever I remember heard of Upper that. Bound. Right. So I was Upper Bound. So they they filled they, you know they paid for all of your applications for whatever you could pay for because my mother didn't even know what the, the application process was like. Mm -hmm. We had no idea what we were doing. They walked me through the process and how to fill out an application. Um, and I wanted to go to Michigan State because Magic Johnson went to Michigan State. Mm -hmm. the, this some real, like, it sounds so stupid when you think no, about no. it. But you get it, right? Yeah. You get it. Like, my love for the Lakers. I'm like, oh, Magic went there. I want to go there. It's sense. all inspiration, influences. That's influences, all. yeah. So then um, my mom's like, it's too cold. You ain't going. I was like, okay. Like, that was it. And then I, I got into UCLA and a couple of other UC schools, and it just made sense. Like, UC Berkeley. Uh, I didn't get into Spelman, and I wanted to go there. I had this, you know, I was like, I'm going to You applied? This. Yeah. Wow. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yo, did you just disrespectful? Was it the grades? I, probably. Yeah. Our SAT score wasn't that great. Wasn't like, high. yeah, all that. All back that. then, it didn't seem like it had to be that high, though. Maybe it was just me. My daughter's was way higher than most Mine of my friends was, back then. I don't think I was great at taking SATs. Like, mm. I, I, I already know that for a fact. Now, but that's the whole point of that 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 standardized testing that has nothing to do with you and you. Right. Right. It's just institutional. So yeah, I failed one. I ended up in a slow class once for a semester. You, you deserved it. it. Just, so, yeah, I was just, just for failing the semester. standardized test. Just yeah. a semester? Yeah, you deserved it. Um, and then look, I, that was it. That's all she wrote. And once I got to school, it just changed everything. It changed my how I lived, how I looked at things. I, I outgrew people and friends. I was watching somebody, um, somebody's online yesterday talk about your college friend versus your your, your college best, best friend versus your, your hood best friend. Mm -hmm. Your hood best friend don't like your college best friend, right? <laughs> your hood best friend is like, she thinks she all that. Jess Hilarious. Right, yes, that. that's what I was, Hilarious. yes. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, Jess posted done. that? I didn't yeah, see yeah, it. She posted that, yeah. It was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> and I was like, no, that's real. So when, you know, I'm, I'm at UCLA, I'm trying to bring my hood friends with me, and my, my and they're like, I don't like her. She thinks she, she you know. And I was like, it's, it's the, everything just starts to change. Your right. world starts to change. You outgrow your family. You outgrow your friends. Yeah, some of your hood friends stop liking you because you're oh, in college. for sure. Yeah. They're like, oh, you think you all that now. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know big words. And so that was, that's where I was. And I think for me, I think a lot of people... When they see me, they see um, an elegance, uh, uh, elegance. They think that I just am, but I'm, you know, the best description of me would be like an elegant hood lady, like I'm ratchet righteous, right? Yeah, like yeah. everyone's like, she thinks she all that. She only like white boys. Did, did you go to a lot of Laker games as a kid? You date white boys? You just said, Let's it. You said you only date white boys. I, just, I do not date white oh. boys. Okay. Goodness gracious! Did you go to a lot of Laker games? <laughs> you you just a, said it. I'm just said, asking. I'm like, I didn't know. I. Get, I, let's not talk to him. <laughs> I'm mad at him for that. I, did, I didn't go to a lot of Lakers games because we couldn't afford them, but I did go to a lot of Clippers games, you believe that or not. And I went to a couple of Lakers games. Were the Clippers games. games way cheaper than the... Oh, hell yeah, because the Clippers are booty. They're ass, right? Jeez. And so they suck, right? You agree, right? Back See, then? How you going to switch up on them if that's the team you used to go see, see all the time? I don't know what you're talking about. Wow. With this L.A. beef. All right, go ahead. That's full beef. It is full beef. LA Clippers beef. going to the finals this year, though, so... <laughs> So, no, we can only. That's the only way you could go. You could afford. They were like the the JV team, right? They were the the the. That <laughs> wow. was the team you could afford Goodness to go gracious. and watch. All that hate. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, it's so much hate. And then so when we could, my grandmother would take me to the games. When we could, we go to the Laker games at the Forum, but we sit in the nosebleeds. And the beauty of my grandmother is, is that she's from the South, and she used to play basketball in the segregated South. Like it's just a beautiful thing. And she would talk. She teach me the game. She'd be like, "Look, let me tell you why we love Magic. Let me tell you about Showtime. Let me tell you all oh. that." Like it was just the most. Like when you look back on it, you you see how my like the influence she had on me and I was the only one who wanted to go with her to the games because she she didn't drive we would take the bus mm -hmm. like we get on the bus take two three buses our back in the day it was rough tough and dirty RTD we take all these buses to get to the forum because it wasn't easy to get to get your little transfer you get there two three dollars however and sit there and sit in the nosebleeds and it was an event Mm. People don't watch bas a little football games anymore. We don't love games like that anymore. I know ain't nobody taking a bus to go public transportation. I mean, you are if you're in this city, but like in LA, like everybody bougie. They want to be cute. They want to be on a. Mm -hmm. They want to be up front. They want to be talking to to Jack. They want to be like slapping hands with LeBron because and everybody. Mm -hmm. Them oh. nosebleeds don't look good on Instagram. Uh, no, heck no. Yeah, that's <laughs> you what that is. And and that was my love. That that's how I fell in love with sports. Like my my grandmother had so much influence on my life in terms of how much she loved the game. And we would go to the Laker parades because all we did was win. You know, that was the time we was back to... <laughs> what we did was win, yo. She is a clipper hater. Just a... Yeah, I know. This is a nice little humble brag. You yeah, right? wait, all we did was win. Yeah, she got 17 championships. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. 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 yeah, what do you mean? How many do they have? Zero. Okay, great. <laughs> Goodness gracious. So, so okay. you never wanted to be a blood <laughs> of Crip? You never, you, never, you never... No, but I used to only want to date Crips. Like it was, I would only want to date. Oh, gangsters Why? were in. Like when I was growing up, Love that was. 
No, not in my neighborhood. They weren't. Not Latin Kings either? No. Just, yeah, you grew up, where did you no. grow up? What, what neighborhood? I grew up in West LA, so it was PBG. Mm-hmm. I'm not a gangster, but it was like these. What's Venice PBG? Shoreline. Playboy Gangster Crip. Okay. Venice Shoreline. Like when you grow up around that, you feel like that's what you like. No, gangsters were in. They were sexy and in. I had a I had a gangster Jerry Curl boyfriend who would pick me up from high school, walk me outside. I'm like, hey. From high school, school and like, I bet you he was in his twenties. <laughs> he was not in his twenties. <laughs> He was in a special program, and he was <laughs> <laughs> he was in a special program. He was not in his twenties; he was okay. nineteen. Excuse you. Okay. What'd you say? Oh, so the, the Jerry curls with a dripping Jerry curl. Yes, like, yes. Don't come, don't come with a dry Jerry curl, because ain't nobody trying to holler. <laughs> like, you, or like it could be soft. Car, like the stain in the back of the. It car. was a stain. Yeah, it could be soft. Oh my goodness. It could be soft. Then listen. What kind listen. of car did he have? Oh, wait, what was it? It was something nice. I used to, what was that, that terminology you used to call girls who only like to date guys with nice cars? Remember car hop? You ever, you ever used to say that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. that's a West Coast thing. You only date guys. He had something, it was something cute. He had hydraulics on it too? Yeah, of, some rims. Listen, pull up like you're in the car. <laughs> <Yo>. <laughs> hey, and so hey, why, So why hi. you never wanted to bang? What kept you from doing that? Because uh, I'm too corny for that. Yeah. I was too corny for that. Like, honestly, I was just, I was really interested in school. Like, mm-hmm. I was really I'm very curious. I'm very much into telling you and debating and talking. So I think I'm, I, but you know how, you know how women are. We like to live on the edge. Like I'm corny, but I, I'm like, okay, go ahead. Show me something. <laughs> you ever stash his drugs or his guns at your crib? I didn't. I did stash my cousin's drugs though. Really? He's in jail for murder now. But yeah, I did. Goodness gracious. Yeah. How I much did. drugs was it? I don't even remember. I was in college. I did it in mm-hmm. college. He just said, you got to do me a favor. He was like, you can't look in here. He's like, I'm going to give you something. You just hold it. And I knew what I was holding. And he was like, just put it away. And I was like, probably 20. And, I, and he's my, like, he's like my brother. And um, I was like, yeah, okay. And I didn't know what I was doing, which you think back on the stupid stuff you do when you work. You just be like, damn, that was stupid. Did he you know pay you I mean? at least? No. Nothing. You he took it? his money and the drugs. He didn't wow. give me no yeah. money. You just a good family member. I was just a good family member. But yeah. you know, like it was like during the riots. You know, you know, family during okay, so during the riots in LA, when when the, the Rodney King riots happened and everybody was looting. Like it was crazy. And I remember we went to go, I was in high school, we went to go pick up my my grandmother. Like she was working in downtown LA and we went to go pick her up. And it was the streets were crazy. People there was stoplights weren't working, fires everywhere. You literally like you ducking and dodging. My grandmother's so nervous. She's sitting on the corner. She just like somebody picked me up. It's just it's just, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like it. The shit was scary. And I remember we picked her up and then we took her home because she lived deep in LA. By then we had moved to Pasadena. And you open up the door and my cousin, God bless him, and his friends had obviously hit every store in the nearby area. <laughs> mm-hmm. You can't even get this. It was radios. It was toys. It was, <laughs> we stepping over everything. And my mother, God bless her, she's sitting up there like, oh my God, this is appalling. Let me grab this radio. I do <laughs> Can you, this is not safe. Let me take this. Go ahead. And I was just like, and I was, we're getting all these mixed messages of, I understood why people were rioting. I did understand the pain. Like you look back on it, you see the pain, but then it just became a free for all. I understand the looting too in certain situations. I do too. It's I just, do too. It's, 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 it's small pockets of black joy. In moments of trauma, you just have to do what you have to do to make yourself feel better. Whatever that is. Yeah. And then whatever that looks like. Uh, I, I think we got a lot of mixed messages. I think growing up, we had a lot of mixed messages. I knew it wasn't right, and I didn't feel any type of way. But I, And my mom knew it wasn't right. But I, we knew that this was happening for a reason. But then, and then there were other races looting. It was crazy. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. It was just full pandemonium. And I, and I remember thinking like the next day we went to school and they didn't shut down school. We just started talking about it. And, and I, for me. They didn't shut down school during the ride? No. We was wow. at, Cause well, we were in Pasadena. So okay, that's okay, not okay. that far. It's like a 20 minute ride. But I remember them talking about, well, what's going on in the world. And we, and we often have these conversations. So while we're here now and last year and last summer, all this is cyclical. You know what I mean? It always happens. It always repeats itself. And so, I don't know about you guys. I didn't think Derek Chauvin was going all three charges. I was I, like, yeah, that I was, was a like, total shock. I was like, all three? Oh, okay, is that what it takes? A 10-minute video of death to mm-hmm. make that happen? Um, but hey, hey, all of these things help form formulate just my, my, my opinion on how I move and how I live. Everything that I've dealt with 
in terms of watching, being so close. Like, you always got to be able to kiss the hood. I wasn't always in the hood, but we can kiss it, you mm-hmm. know? And so there is that part of me where you'd be like, oh, okay, she she appears, but there's just so much more. Because I've been, I've been there. I'm still there. Like, mm-hmm. it's, I'm not removed. So many of us are not removed, no matter what it looks like on the outside. We're, we're literally still dealing with the same thing. That's right. Well, how did you get your start in broadcasting now? So now break into that. So you, you graduate UCLA, and how did you get into broadcasting? Um, I started interning, so like everybody. So I was Where? interning. Where are your interns at? We only, we have oh, one. We the only allow COVID, one right so we don't. No, have, we don't have any interns. Yeah, we don't have any right no, now. No interns. Oh, okay. None, just sitting around. Nobody. No. Not because of COVID. I mean, it, we, we will. You know, we once have everything bucks. is officially open, we're not officially open yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was interning at local news stations, mm-hmm. um, and and then I got a job at a station called uh, in LA called Channel Thirteen, and I was an assignment editor. And so what happens was, is as an assignment editor, you find different stories for reporters to go out and get. I didn't know what I was doing, but they didn't care either. So I'm sitting up here faking my way, making my way through the world today. Um, and and eventually, I would I got enough courage to ask one of the reporters, could I go out with you and make a resume tape? Like, you know, it was tape back then. Right? Mm-hmm. And so she goes, yeah, of course. And so I just started asking all these reporters to help me. And I finally put a tape together on my own, like, in, in after I got done working, one of my... 20,000 jobs and then I'd go out and I and I just shoot with them. And then I just sent every single tape out. I had like 13 tapes. I sent them all out and everybody's like, "No, nope, no, nope, we're not interested." I remember flying up to Fresno. I, I guess the ticket at the time might have been 150 bucks and I had like $172 in my pocket. And I just flew up to Fresno to talk to a news director and and he was like, "Well, thanks for coming." It was literally like a 20, 20 minute meeting and I was like, "Damn." I ain't got no more money and then he just don't he didn't even like me. I thought he'd meet me in person, it'd be great. But all I knew is, is that I had to do it. It was so you ever care so much about something, which I'm sure you have. Mm-hmm. You, you just like, I don't care. I don't care. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. So I get a call from this news director in West Virginia. And he's like, You can start working. I, maybe it was twelve thousand a year. I'm making up something. But mm-hmm. I do remember my checks might have been like four fifty every two weeks. because I, mm-hmm. I was it was poor. I was poor. I could have been working at a fast food restaurant making more money at the time. And um, he's like, we'll give you the job. It's a one-man band. You you got to shoot the camera yourself. You got to edit everything yourself. You got to do everything yourself. So please, if you want to come from L.A. to West Virginia, the job is yours. And I was like, okay. And that was it. And I, I packed up my Nissan Altima, whatever little things I had in my little Altima, and drove across country. You drove across country? I drove. It took me five days to get there. Wow. I drove hey. across country, and I got the job. I, I didn't even know who my roommate was. She was a, she was a this is crazy. She was a um, a reporter there, and her parents had bought her a condo. Just some real, that's the kind of stuff you want to do for your kids, right? Absolutely. Like, mm-hmm. you want to take care of your kids that way. You want to set them up right, if you, if you think that way. And her parents were like, this is your first job. We don't know anything about this place. Why not buy this condo and invest in it while you're here, and it'll be great. So her parents bought her a condo, and she ended up getting a roommate, me, and some other people. Um, and we would pay her rent every month, and, you know, she was living her best life. She, was, she wasn't struggling one bit. I was struggling. <laughs> so she... She was my roommate, but it was a great experience. And the first time that I ever realized I was like, oh, I can do this was we, we did a couple of stories on people who were homeless and losing their losing everything, their trailer, if you will, because we were in a very, very par- poor part of the country. And, and, and how could we help them? And then I did, all of it just made sense. I don't, it just all made sense. I was like, I should be doing this. This is what I should be doing. I love it. It's great. I'm amazing. I love it. And I was and I was hungry, mm-hmm. so I would work six days a week. I was only supposed to work five days a week. Mm-hmm. I worked six days a week. It, it was just to tell the story, to learn how to edit, to learn how to carry the tripod, tripod, to white balance, to to make sure that I'm you know shooting right. I'm all the thing, all the things that it took to tell really great stories. And I was like, this is what I'm gonna do forever for the rest of my life. I was in love. You know, love. stories like that are why we demand so much from the next generation. Oh, for sure. Because that's just a different type of grind. It is. Drive cross country five days to go to West Virginia. Hi. All because you just love something. Yes. You're just happy to be and in position. And make $2. Dollars and, uh, and be happy to make $2. Uh, and be broke and be hungry. Night, plenty, many a hungry nights. Thank God I had my roommate. She would let me eat her food. I was, I mean, and because I, I still had a car note. Like, of course, some black shit. Excuse me. I had, mm-hmm. to, had a car note. Mm-hmm. I, I couldn't afford my car. My car was like maybe two fifty a month. My rent was three twenty five. I wasn't even making that. Like, it was just so much. I was so poor, but I was so happy. Like, I would never, I wouldn't trade it. For, I mean, the video, man, we were trying to find some old videos and uh, we had called the station and they didn't, they hadn't transferred them over, but they were in the process of doing that. And the level of poverty on TV was crazy. And I'm talking about what I look like. Shiny, <laughs> forehead, 
<laughs> suit too big, hair ridiculous. I wasn't out here trying to be stormed. But the edges had looked like edges, back then, uh, though. They were big edges, though. Okay, they were big edges. Okay. They were all mine. Okay. Uh huh. At the time, but it was it was a sad situation. It was really sad. But I didn't I didn't know any better. And I remember people telling me, because it was like market. There's like maybe 200 markets, so it was like market 147. And I remember I was interviewing this one guy, and he was like, you know, only the big people can make it to the top 10. It's so it's probably a tough business for you, just so you know. It's really only the bigs make it to the top 10. And I just remember thinking, fool, I'll see you later. You know what right. I mean? Like, don't don't put your drama on me and your sadness and your killed dreams on me. I remember thinking, I love this so much. It doesn't, and it wasn't even about being famous. It was about, it was about telling stories that were representative of us, our right. people, and what we look like. Like, I, we didn't have that many images of black women on television winning. Like I had Oprah and then and then they had to look a certain way, right? Do you guys remember back in the day when you would look at black women on TV? Local news, I think there was more of an opportunity because I saw local women that I on my local news station that I loved, but there were very few images of us just being us. And and you think, okay, that's that is who we are. That's the full breath of a black woman. She's mm-hmm. elegant, but she'll cuss you out too. And she is sweet, but she don't play that. You know, all of the things that we really encompass and you didn't see that. And I remember thinking I would, the one or two images that I had were so inspiring. And then I didn't realize when I was on TV in a way in which people could watch that that was inspiring for them because you just get so caught up in, you know, work. And then I thought to myself, well, this is this is important. This is an important legacy. This is an important image to have. Um, you know, I, I, I meet so many young girls that come to me and say, my dad made me watch you when you was on ESPN or my dad said this or whatever, and you have, you just changed what I wanted to do. And it just blows me away, because I'm like, what? You know, in my mind, I'm just this still the little girl in West Virginia mm. with better edges, you know, <laughs> and a better car. <laughs> I, need, I, I need all those steps, okay? I need all the steps to ESPN yeah, before we get to now, right? So West Virginia, then what's next? After West Virginia, um, I was there for about a year. That was a rough year, but I learned a lot, and then I was able to fly back home. I didn't have to drive, so that was great. And they shipped my car. I was living great. Um, and then I worked at this place called Orange County News Channel. So it would be probably the equivalent of SNY here, right? Mm-hmm. It was just a regional news network. Not as big as SNY, but it was a regional news network, and, and it was just covering Orange County, California. So I was an assignment editor during the week and a reporter on the weekends because they didn't really want me to report because they just felt like I didn't have enough experience. But But... A woman by the name of Suzanne Lysak, who I love, gave me the opportunity to report. She was like, I see it. She was like, your voice is good. She was like, I see it. You just need somebody, just one person to believe. You don't need everybody to believe, just mm-hmm. one. Oh, you need one yes. You just need one yes. And so I would do that. And then I finally put a tape together. And then another tape, because you all, it's all about what you look like. And then I, I, I um, worked at E! Entertainment as a producer for a while because I, I got discouraged. And I was like, I'm not doing this no more. You got tired of being in front of the camera? No, I got dis- I got tired of not having a full time position in front of the camera because gotcha. people were telling me that it's just going to be, you know, I was getting more no's and you get yes, mm-hmm. yeses. And then so I worked at E Entertainment. I worked on um, a show called Glow. Um, and her, what is J Lo's sister? She was the host of the show. What's J Lo's sister's name? J Lo got a sister. Yeah, her sister's a host. Mm-hmm. I forget her name. She back in the day, she was a host. Mm-hmm. So she does sports. She used to do sports here. But anyway, she was the host of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was like, F it, I'm gonna try, I'm just gonna go all out. And then I got a call from a guy in West Palm Beach, Florida, which was like market 39, which mm-hmm. is a real, it's, I mean, real TV now, mm-hmm. right? So it's, you got a cameraman, you don't have to shoot anything, you're going live, you're doing everything, you're doing all the things to be a TV reporter. Um, and that was my real, that was my first real opportunity to do it five days a week and really learn. Um, and so I moved to Florida. And I did it in West Palm. It was sleepy West Palm. And I remember the very first time that I went live, it was a full disaster. Like, you ever watch somebody go live on TV and cannot talk? You, you see these videos of people just being yep. it. was That's exactly what happened. And who got that video? Put that on YouTube for the Yo, culture, y'all. It let's, was, let's see that. Yeah, it probably will pop up now. It was a full disaster. I was like, I the, I remember a guy. It was like Cindy Brady when the red light came on? Yeah, you, no, no. The, it was it was sadly, and I'm not saying it dismissively, someone had died. Um, someone drowned in the pool. And I didn't know how to say this person died. I just should have been like, one one person was dead. One we found one person dead. Whatever. And so I remember being like, I, I vaguely it was like someone's passed on. They they went away. They've gone. They've gone above. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> All dogs go to heaven. Pour out a little liquor. 
I was like, and and so, um, but you, it, that's real. You just your first time covering a murder or even a death. You don't know what to say. I was like, they've they've gone away. They've they've passed on. They've passed on. They've gone. Ahead. They have cards like, for you. Who like cue cards? Like, no, like, no, no, no. You got to write wow. all that stuff down yourself, and you have to be able to talk about it. And I remember. I, it was a disaster. <laughs> it was such a disaster. Oh my God. I couldn't get it out. And I remember passing it back to the anchor and it did back to you. Like, I, whatever, I, it was just a disaster. And I remember going home and crying and being like, I'm never going to get at this. What I did suck. your boss say? Oh, he called me in the office Monday morning because it was Sunday. He was like, here, do you want to talk? I was like, yeah, I already know. I was like, he about to fire me. This is it. I did moved all the way out here to Florida to get fired. And he was like, so what happened last night? <laughs> what happened? Like, you should have just said I was overcome with emotion. It's such a sad story. No. I, I said, I just lost my words. I didn't know how to say that one person drowned to death. I didn't know if that was the way to say it. I don't remember the particulars, but I just couldn't say your first murder, your first death, your first everything on air, live television, no cue cards. You just, you can't figure it out. Like, you just don't mm-hmm. know what to say. And I never thought that was a real thing. There is, trust me, there's some struggling reporters right now who are like, yes, that's, that's real. Right. That's mm-hmm. real. Or anybody just, who's going live. You, yeah, because yeah. you just, you couldn't find the words. And what I, that's when I realized that the art of telling a great story and going live is ad-libbing. Anybody who could just ad-lib. So from that moment on, I went home and I would just go in the mirror and just hold my old scripts and just ad-lib. I would give myself scenarios to ad-lib. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, all right, if I pull up and it's a um, a robbery at a bank, well, the, give me the who, what, when, where, and why. And I would just ad lib in the, I'd literally just ad lib in the mirror and just till, just till it made sense, till I could put my sentences together, till I, till I knew what I was saying um, and thinking quick on your feet. And mm-hmm. so I just remember it was such a disaster. Oh God, it was such a disaster. And then I had on this, and then my boss, not only did he try to figure out what happened, he asked me about this necklace I wore because, you know, you can't get your look. The look is also a thing. Mm-hmm. You you watching people just getting the whole look. It's the way you talk. It's the it's the way you look. Are you distracting me on camera? What Can I pay wearing? Were you wearing a gang sign? I was wearing some big ass necklace that had like some medallion. Like it was just right like this. And he was like, and that's a bit distracting too. <laughs> and I was just like, okay. I just was I was trying yeah. to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't know what I needed. To, it all was just a disaster. Like everyone who just really gets on TV and understands how it's supposed to come together. I mean, I've, I've had a few losses So this is your fourth then. spot. It's West Virginia, back to L.A. You worked at two spots. Now Florida, then what? I go to Atlanta. Atlanta? Too. God dang. So Atlanta. I went to Atlanta, and that was number, that was market eight, and uh, I was a weekend anchor. And I remember thinking I was rich because that was the first time I ever got paid six figures. I remember wow. thinking, like, this is it. I'm mm-hmm. so rich. Like, what am I going to do with myself? I don't even know what to do with myself. I'm so rich. Um, so you was a news reporter in Atlanta, too? I was a news reporter. This was in Atlanta, uh-huh. too, so. Yeah, I was at WGCL. That you was must have had a mansion. Yeah, so I thought. Well, what I, we was living right, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I I remember thinking, God, this is great. I'm going to Atlanta, but it was the last place station in Atlanta. So when you work at the last place, anything, as you guys know, as y'all have come up through the radio market, it's never it's never a good thing, right? They all have their own inherent troubles. And mm-hmm. so I remember working really hard and being really good. That was my first time ever in my adult life experiencing blatant racism. Because mm-hmm. when you grow up in California, racism is really hidden. Right. So Atlanta taught me a lot. Like it really it raised me. But I remember thinking while there, look at all these beautiful black faces. Look at all these people. The mayor is black. The chief Mm -hmm. of police is black at the time. It was just all this. Everybody was just winning. Doctors, lawyers. It was just the most amazing thing for me to see, honestly, because growing up in California, you know how L.A. is. It's just you don't see that. You're like, Mm -hmm. where the blacks at? Where we Mm -hmm. hang out at? We're just it's it's a very diverse area. And I thought this is so amazing. However, I got fired in Atlanta. So that was my first time, which I think everybody should get fired. I've been fired I, I, four times. I understand. Yeah, right. <laughs> but you mm-hmm. need to be fired. If somebody's listened, if you have not been fired yet, then you don't know shit. What'd you get fired for? Uh, because you, I don't know if you guys remember the case of Janarlo Wilson. Janarlo Wilson was a, a kid who spent, he was a black kid who had a, a girlfriend who was 15 and I think he was 17. And he went to, it was a Romeo and Juliet law that put him in jail for rape because he had sex with her, consensual sex mm. with his girlfriend. And they put him in jail. And I remember everyone was so disappointed because he was such a good kid and he played sports and his mom had been working with a group of people to get him released. It was a big deal in Atlanta. Um, and we had worked the story and I had been working the story. And I remember I got the call the day that he finally was getting released. So I go to the news desk and I'm so excited. And I'm like, he's released. Where do I go? Put me on it. And they took me off of it and put another girl on it that they liked. 
and I was I lost it. I went off. Now we leave it there. Two months later, because they was done with me, because I had made a scene, right? There was a, who's this little girl running around here thinking she know much? Like you ain't on the story, it's somebody else's. But I had every right to be angry. It was how I handled it. My reaction was, I, I mean, I didn't have to cuss everybody out in the newsroom. I didn't have to scream. I didn't have to act a fool. Um, but I was angry because it was just unfair. And so I remember two months later, maybe less than two months later, I'm I'm doing a weekend anchor, and we on commercial break, and I'm talking to my co-anchor. His name is Mike, and we laughing. And I lean over, and I guess my mic is hot. I'm like, that mother sucker. You know, something that black <laughs> folks just say, right? I'm like, that mother sucker. I'm like, just talking to him. Mic is hot. And they're like, did she curse? Oh, you was live on here? It was a commercial break, though. I didn't know I was live. My <laughs> mic was still hot. Mic is always hot. Mic is always hot. And so I was like, I didn't think anything of it. So the next day, it started to get traction. Like, my bosses were calling me. They're like, did you curse? I was like, no. I said, mother sucker. And then, you know, they were like... No, you didn't. Who uses that word? Which is a very common word in the community. Mm-hmm. But they didn't know that, right? Because they like, what? What are you saying? And I remember, I remember thinking, oh, this is turning into something that's really not a big deal, but a big deal. But it had everything to do with how I reacted two months earlier. Because mm-hmm. they was just trying to get rid of me. Because I had a bad attitude, if you mm-hmm. will, or I, I was uncomfortable, or I was too aggressive. All the all the titles you give a black woman who has a lot to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and they tried to fire me. And they did actually. They they did actually fire me. Then I I uh, protested. I don't know what we did. Me and my agent did something where we protested and said, "No, I got four more months left on my contract. You can't fire her because you can't prove that she cursed." Um, and it started to get traction in Atlanta because people start to talk about it. You know, in Atlanta, they got your back. Mm-hmm. And then so I got my job back, but the but I was only there till my contract ended, which was in like four months later. But I remember for like the next year and a half, if you ever Googled me, it'd be a Carrie Mother Sucker champion. <laughs> <laughs> now you're taking Michael Black's whole energy. I know, right? Right? Exactly. Yeah. Now it's now it's funny. That's like, the name of Michael's podcast, exactly. Mother Sucker. Mother Sucker. Yeah. And so now that was my name. I was like in an urban dictionary. I was trying to get jobs. Nobody went to hire me because I was the girl who cursed on air, which is stupid because people curse on air all the time now. Like now it's stupid to even think about that I went through that. Mm-hmm. But I remember I had to pivot, and I was like, okay, I gotta, I have to reinvent myself. And I was like, let me just go to my other love, which is sports, which I've always covered in local news. And so I went to Tennis Channel. Boom, that's what I remember. And then I was at Tennis Channel, and I remember auditioning for that job, not knowing how to pronounce a name. And then two months in, I was, I owned it. I was like, it was my beat. I owned it. So like, you weren't even that, a tennis fan. You just that was just a means to an end. I well, well, I lived in Florida. I covered Venus and Serena. To mm-hmm. the, I mean, that's how much tennis I knew. Venus and Serena, Andre Agassi, Pete Sampras, those you know that that mm-hmm. level of tennis. Mm-hmm. You know, Andy Roddick. But I wasn't like, oh, tell me more about Svetlana Kuznetsova. You know what I mean? Or Martina Navratilova or Maria Sharapova. All the all the all the names that you would have to learn to cover this. Novak Djokovic wasn't a big deal then. Or um, all these different things. I just had to learn it all, and I owned it. And I think I, I appreciate Tennis Channel because they respected my hustle. And they then took me from covering local tournaments to the French Open, Australian Open, a U.S. Open. Mm-hmm. They put me on the – and knowing that I wasn't as astute as some of the other people who were covering it, but they appreciated the hustle. And they knew that I was going to work hard. Like, you need 10 hours, you need 15 hours, whatever. How many hours you need? I'm here. I'm on the ground. What you need? And I remember doing a big interview with Andre Agassi, which kind of set – me into this trajectory of eventually going to ESPN. He had this book, his new book, I think it was called Open, and he was very much honest about how he was taking drugs and he wanted to talk about it and how WADA, the you know, the World Doping Association eventually said, okay, you failed the drug test, but we love you so much that we're not going to tell nobody because, you know, they wow. needed him. Mm-hmm. They needed him for the sport. Tennis needs their stars, mm-hmm. which is why, you know, side note, when <clears throat> Maria Sharapova got in trouble and suspended, I thought that was weird because... They let her know like 17 times before, like, look, this, this, this is about to come down on you if you don't fix this. Because they need their stars. They appreciate mm-hmm. their stars. Mm-hmm. Another story about Serena later, like they don't love her as much as I think they should. But that was my my end. And so we go to the U.S. Open and ESPN is recording right next to us. And then I just I literally look and I said, oh, if I want to do this for real, for real, like on a on a big level, mm-hmm. I should go there. And that's where I went. And that wasn't easy. Would <clears throat> well, you start sending tapes in, or did you know somebody? I did. Uh, I I sent my resume reel to this guy named Jerry, and this is why his name is Jerry Madelon, and this is why it's funny because he was like, "Okay, Carrie, this is great. If you're ever in town, come by." You know, people say that, and they don't mean it. 
You mean don't tell me that. So I bought myself a ticket. You stopped by? Oh, yes, I did. Word I bought up. myself a ticket and I sat in that lobby and I, I was like, Jerry, I'm here. And he came and he talked to me for like 30 minutes and he was really nice. And he was like, now where are you from? Because he thought I was like down the street. I said, I flew in from LA. He was like, you did? Like, and he was just like, what? He's like, well, let me try to find some other people for you to meet with. And I was like, well, thank you. And then I spent the whole day there talking to people. And then I didn't get the job right away. I think a year and a half later, they called me up and said they had an opening on this show called First Take and would I be interested? And I thought- so you didn't my, have to audition or nothing? No, of course I had to audition. Oh. I was still working at Tennis Channel and I was still sending him, I would just always stay in touch with him and send him stuff. I would mm -hmm. just be like, Jerry, here go my stuff. You, what you got? You got anything for me? But you know, I'm so simple. I'm like, let's just, I could be a Laker reporter. Like I was ready to be on, I was about to be on the Laker beat. And then he was like, well, we do have this show called, and, 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 and the time, He's leaving, and do you want to work? I was like, where's he going, the guy who was hosting? And I was like, no, really? Okay, well, okay, I'll come and audition. And I auditioned, and I remember leaving the audition. Um, and I said, oh, I, I got it. I walked out of there and said, I got it. I you killed know. it. I knew, I felt it. And I said, and if I don't get it, it's because they're going to give it to a white woman. Because at the time, black women weren't hosting anything Monday through Friday on that network. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and if I don't get it, it's because they're giving it to a blonde. Little did I know that the reason why I was there was because people inside had been protesting that the only people who had been auditioning were blondes. Mm, like there was wow. there was an inside movement from folks who were just like, if we see another blonde girl walk up in here and audition for this show and no diversity, and and kudos to the people behind the scenes who were able to speak to the powers that be to, to say, we need to get some diversity. And I remember, I, I guess it was me, I even think Rashawn Ali, went, uh, try, like it was, a, it was a handful of browns that mm. went in there. And I said, if they don't call me um, within the next, you know, I gave it a deadline. And I said, if they don't call me within the next few days, then I don't have it. And they and they called me. And then they said, we want to offer you the job, but, you know, you got to you got to do A, B, C and D. Um, and then I get the job and it was, it was that was it. Wow. It, it, you know, I always at ESPN, you, you know, of course, as you can see, you're very opinionated. You got a lot to say. Why didn't ESPN give you the opportunity to express that more? Why was it more of just a moderator role? Because that's what, not what the show was about, right? Mm -hmm. The show was about two guys <clears throat> named Skip and Stephen A. Who um, who you love. Who have varying opinions. And mm -hmm. so, you stupid. <laughs> he's, he's how shady he is. He is. I, oh, how do you deal with him? Because he wants me to ask, like, what? You don't love them? Uh, yeah, yeah. Why would I? Now, come on. Come come on. I would never. Why would he say that? <laughs> He's silly. The reality is, and it, it, now that I look at it and I have, I have perspective, they were the stars. Like mm -hmm. you, you. I, I'm not arguing with Skip, who has been in the business by then. When I had stepped in, he'd been in business for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Stephen A. had been covering stuff for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Like they, they OGs. Mm -hmm. So they don't even know who I am. I'm. They like Tennis Channel. Where she come from? And so I agree with them protecting who they are. Like when you first get on that desk, because you don't know me, and you're like, who is this person? What is she gonna do? So they didn't have no respect for you at first. Uh, they, no, I was a rook. I was straight up rook. Like if I had to go get coffee, I probably would have had to go get coffee. They didn't tell me to do that, but I was a rook, and I understood that, and I was okay with that. But there were times, you know, after I had been on the desk for long enough, where I had earned enough respect. I believe that that not necessarily that I had to be the person giving an opinion, but it is nice to have a different perspective from a woman, especially if you're talking about domestic violence, Absolutely. the Ray Rice situation and, Absolutely. you know, and rape and those, and that, that's a com not common, but that, that topic comes up a lot mm -hmm. in sports, as you well know. And so, sadly, uh, sadly mm -hmm. and then a defining moment was, you know, the Ray Rice situation. And it really truly made me understand that my role was not to talk. Mm. And and when I went to the folks who were in charge, they kind of danced around it and they wanted they wanted to tell me the right things. But they they, too, were trying to figure this out. You have to understand everybody was figuring out there was no Ray Rice really changed the game the way we covered domestic violence, honestly, in sports. Why? Because of the video? Or... Because of the video. Okay. Now, it's been there all the whole time. But now you got this evidence. You, some of the greats, you people, Hall of Famers have been beating their wives and their mm -hmm. girlfriends. And we know it. And we've never talked about it. Ray Rice changed the game. And so we then had to go into someone's quote unquote personal life because allegedly you're not supposed to talk about nobody's personal life, right? But now we have to because there's video, there's video evidence. And so I think everybody was still trying to figure it out. The problem is, is that if you don't teach your children or the people within your flock, women specifically, how to, or if you don't make them feel safe giving their opinions, mm -hmm. they don't know how to give their opinions. Right. And so I didn't feel safe giving my opinion. And then when I finally did, if it didn't come out right, if it was uncomfortable, if I made mistakes, it's because I knew 
people around me didn't respect what I was saying and I and I didn't feel safe. That's incredibly intimidating to take <sighs> be in a room with people who have been covering this for all of their lives and I'm just brand new to the game, but I do have an opinion about some simple common sense, right? Some mm -hmm. s simple common mm -hmm. sense. You don't have to be an expert to talk about domestic violence in the sense that you have to be able to identify right from wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel comfortable talking in that environment or when you do get the opportunity, I was always nervous. Anytime I got an opportunity to speak up, I was nervous. I was scared. I was like, oh, did I say something wrong? Did I mess them up? Okay, shoot, are they mad at me? And then we were sitting in such close proximity, right? So you know how this is when you can feel the energy. Energy is louder than what mm -hmm. I have to say. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if I'm saying something that they don't agree with or they don't want me to say or she's taking my shine or whatever, I don't know, right? The, you feel that energy of this is pissing me off. So imagine dealing with that for two hours a day, you know, and then still coming in every day just like whatever effort to you earn their respect, which I think I ultimately did mm -hmm. in various ways. But that was... That's a, that was the hardest job I ever had and, and probably will ever have. Just because of the star power of Steven and Skip? Or, or just because of the conditions, <clears throat> the, the way that it was set up. It was set up for them to debate and for me to throw out a question and then lay out. And you can even see now, like in past hosts, after I've, when they want to weigh in, people get mad when the other hosts want to weigh in. They get mad because you really just want to hear the boys. You've been so conditioned to mm -hmm. hear the boys. And that's not the way it should be. Um, there, should, there should be a way where a woman should be because women in sports, we talk about how far we've come, but you know, it's still a boys club. Y'all know that. Like yeah. you, a woman given an opinion, period. But let alone in sports, no one wants to hear that because of the way that we have been socialized and conditioned. That's just a fact. I know I see women making strides, but it is a boys club. And it's not even I'm not even referring to just skipping Stephen A. I'm saying any woman who comes on, I think of my 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 girl Jay. She comes on, she says Jamel Hill. Yeah, Jamel. She says something. Go back to the kitchen. Shut up. Don't nobody want to hear that. I have said things before that have been right on. And I have been, <laughs> as you say, jumped online for having an opinion, mm -hmm. and, uh, an honest opinion. It's just the way the, it's the world, the way we are set up. Is ESPN a safe space for women? <clears throat> That's a great question. I think that it's working to be a safe space for women. I think that there are women who feel safe, um, who are working in different aspects and they feel safe and encouraged. Because if they have decided to choose you, right, if you're the selected one, then they're gonna protect you mm -hmm. and you're gonna feel safe. Everybody doesn't get that right off the bat. It's just the margin, <clears throat> this like, I can, this is how much, mar the margin for error is like this for women. Mm -hmm. We can't make any mistakes. And if you do, or if you fall out of grace, you'll see it, you know what I'm saying? Did you ever feel it safe there? Safe? Mm -mm. No. Wow. And why did you leave first take too? What 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 happened there? Um, I left because what I've been there for two and a half years. I left because I had an opportunity to to host Sports Center, but I also left because I mean it's just it's a tough it's a tough gig, man. Mm -hmm. I I don't I can't describe it unless you've been there, which is you know, kudos to Molly. You know what I mean? Uh, it it's um. It's one of these things where if you are working in an environment, uh, and these guys are like, I, please, let me just say this. I want you, I'm giving everybody context. What I learned from Skip and Stephen A is hard work. Those guys work harder than anybody I know. Mm -hmm. They're not lazy. They don't just pop up and come to work and talk and be like, whatever. They like, we do five days a week, we do 10 days a week. You, you wanna work 10 hours a day? Great, that's what, like, hard work, researched, the level of preparation they both, I watch them both do in that show, watch every game, program after program, everything down to the T, research everything. I respected that and so you can't help but to respect that hustle. So what they make and where they are is completely understandable. Mm -hmm. But they grew up differently and women such as myself didn't really have a big role and still don't in sports. I can name a few OGs, you know, Hannah Storm and you know, there there are a few OGs who've been here that you respect. Um, Doris Burke, I, like she hands down one of the best ever to do it. Um, I think of all these amazing women, but for me, I had I had came in very differently and late. Like I didn't grow up there, right? I had been working all those other places, mm -hmm. and then I came and I was an outsider. And then I was on this show that people love to hate, not necessarily just 
me, but they loved to hate the show because it was always something going on controversial, Mm -hmm. um, which made the show so great. Um, So the circumstances were tough. And and then I was constantly, or I felt like I had to constantly prove myself. And then when I finally got this opportunity, when um, to host Sports Center, I remember, <laughs> I remember, they'd be like, you know, it's really fast. You know, it's a lot of highlights. Things are gonna go fast. Mm-hmm. You know, like you know, talking to me like, you're so, if you know, if you're okay with this, your co-host is gonna be this guy named David Lloyd, and he'll help you. Let me tell you the beauty about how it all worked out. David Lloyd was very clear early on that Carrie is my co-host. The show is not mine. If you have something to ask, ask both of us. He had my back. Like that that man is salt of the earth. And that was a blessing because of what I had came through. I didn't think I would ever see that. And he, he was, was using his privilege to help you. He used all of his because they would try to defer to him and producers would only talk to him. And he'd be like, what did Carrie say? And I'm like, thank you. I, thank you. Mm-hmm. And that's something we should all do. Right. When you have the power, you better give it away. Like, right. That is just the truth. And he was sharing that with me so much so to the point that he was like, Carrie, you think I don't know you to start the show? He was like, I'm going to do me, you do you. And he, there was no jealousy, no riff, no nothing. And I was like, wow. And he helped me really, one, uh, feel safe. That was my, when you said I feel safe, I take that back. There was this period of when I did did sports center for about two years i felt really safe i felt i felt like i had encouragement i felt people had my back i felt really really good and the show was good um and then you know it's cyclical it turns it goes you know Mm -hmm. depending on who's in charge i i i I just know that it is tough for women in that environment unless you are what i like to call the chosen one a particular one that has been set apart um, where they say we respect you and you deserve and even then it's hard it's just hard. There's still so many strides because, unfortunately, the women who get in power, right, the bosses, forget they're women. And they start being one of the boys, right? They, they become what they used to hate. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you're like, dog, you, you, me and you came up through the mud together. I literally, I was a friend of mine, a woman who works there, a boss, walked up to my homegirl and told her she should smile more at work. A black woman told her to smile more. What, would you ever tell a man to smile more? Would anybody ever tell you to smile more at work? <laughs> no. You, you, you would never. Mm-mm. You would. Ne- your boss would never be like. You know what, Envy? Could you smile more on air? Because you come across angry. Mm-hmm. What kind of shit is that? Mm-hmm. So it's tough. And, and I left. Said. I left because I just wanted to. You know, look. I'm. I'm. I'm untamed, if you will. But you was plotting your exit, though. So you started plotting your ex- exit around sports in the time, right? Oh yeah. I had you listen. I love how Charlie acting like he don't know none of this. This is great. Yeah. Listen, as a true story, I had been. I had. I had wanted to leave. Oh, Jesus, like I, my plan when I first got there. I can't even. Believe, I'm telling y'all this. My plan when I first got there was to leave probably two years after I got there. I had stayed six years too long, mm-hmm. and I remember thinking, oh, "Okay, I'm gonna come here for two years. I'm gonna go back home." I had a whole, you know, but you never know. It wasn't the right time. But I remember there were many a days I could call Charlamagne, I'm mad, I'm out of here. These people, I'm out of here. And he'd be like, what? What's going on? I don't know, I understand. <laughs> it's how he is right now. Because it seems like, you know, it's ESPN. Once you get to ESPN, you think that's where, that's the end all be all. It is for a lot of people, mm-hmm. honestly. And that makes sense. Like, I agree with it being the end all be all for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. For me, my destination changed. My journey right. is always going to be different. You can always evolve. You, I think... And I'm not just saying this. You guys really have something special. It is hard to work in a team format. It well, is. ain't easy. It gives you who you tell it. I get you. I already know. I, I can hate feel. these niggas a million times. Okay. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. You know that. I know. I do know. No. I do know how hard it is. You think about a, a sinking group, and I always applaud you guys for keeping the main thing the main thing. And and that takes a lot of. Um, Ultimately, you got to have respect for people. Ultimately, you got to be tired of beefing with people. Mm-hmm. And you didn't have to appreciate what their gifts are and their contributions are. And if you can't acknowledge their gift or their contribution to this, to the club, to the group, then they shouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. And so I I feel, I hear it all the time. People always ask, man, it's not the same when it was Skip, Stephen, and you. It's not the same. It's not. The, I hear it all the time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, some groups weren't. And I honestly love Skip and Stephen A together. I think they are amazing together, and I and I I, I really do. I do too. I, and it's unfortunate that it didn't work out, but I get it. But there is a time, and you talk about my plot. There's a time when you realize it's time to go. Now, if it's on your spirit, it's almost like any relationship. If it's on your spirit for a little bit, it could go away, and you're like, okay, good, we good, we back together, we back together. I love him. I love him. He cute. I love her. I'm gonna stay married. Uh, whatever. But if it's consistently on your spirit. And you're, and I got to the point, 
where I was ashamed that I thought not being on TV every day would take away from who I was. That could not be my identity. I'm like, dang, so am I really tripping off if I'm not on TV every day? Like, who gives a damn? This is not what I, this is not what I came here to do. I came to tell stories that matter, that impact. And I was I was struggling with that. I think my team was struggling with that, too. They didn't say that all right. They're like, make all this money, you're going to leave. You're going to do this. You, got, you sure you're walking away from all this? Like, they were so, I had nobody encouraging me. Like, girl, jump! Except for my best friend, right? It's always your best friend. It's always that one that's just like, do it. You're going to do it. You're going to win. Jay was like that, too. Jamel Hill was like that, I was well. encouraging you. Sorry, somebody hit my door. <laughs> What's encouraging you? You gave me a very generic <laughs> response. What was, what was, this, what was response? this response? He was just like, well, if that's what you feel is right. That's the truth, though. You, no, but, you got to feel things in your spirit. But if, if I am... That's a half-assed that's thing. No, it's right, not. Right? <laughs> no, it's not, because nine times out of ten, the person already knows what it is they want to do and mm -hmm. what they need to do. Mm -hmm. So if you feel that's what you need to do, do it. No, but you weren't saying it like, like what I needed... And he didn't have to give that to me. But you, when someone's making a life and they're going to people that they that they really consider a part of their crew, when they're making these life changing decisions, you need encouragement. Mm -hmm. Jump. You got it. If it don't work out, you'll figure it out. So it was, I definitely did that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I definitely Charlamagne was like, did that. If you would like this mayonnaise sandwich on we toast, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you so damn dry. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. So you so damn. about this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Naked. But no, hold on, because you met Jamel at ESPN, right? Because <laughs> she and and that I'm sure helped you with your decision. Yeah. To leave. Yeah. Listen. We all know what happened to her. She had to go. Um, it was just a relationship didn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't my impetus for leaving. I had stayed probably a year and a half later. But I just remember, I just knew there was a change. There was a change in, in, in the regime, and there was a change in how people could speak. There was a time in which we could talk about Colin Kaepernick freely. We, mm -hmm. There was a time in which we could cover him. There was a time in which we could say, so we could have social justice issues. And at the time that I was there, there was just like, mm, we don't do that. We don't do that. Now they do it. But, they, but when I was there and I was making this decision to leave, they weren't doing that. And I think I think that I think the pandemic, I think George Floyd changed everybody, every corporate social systems like they, they addressed it. They're doing it now. They're all into it. Let's talk about it. So I remember that here. This is how it went. I, I, I had an opportunity to host a show with The Rock again. And I and I felt like because I wasn't in good grace graces, if you will, they didn't love me, uh, that they wouldn't allow me to host it. They were going to say, no, you can't host it. Um, and if, and in my mind, I said, if they told me I can't host it and still keep my gig, then I'm leaving. That's just going to be my, my jump. And that was just something I needed. I needed something to say, do it. Because it had been on my, it had been on my heart for a long time. And all the, all the while, I had been taking meetings like we all mm -hmm. do. I'm taking meetings. I'm talking to different people at different places. They all are like, oh, so you ready to leave ESPN? Why leave ESPN? You ready? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. What you got here? And they're like, and they, everyone felt like, well, do we have anything as massive, as big of a platform? I was like, that's not what this is about. And, and I remember having countless meetings with TNT and be like, no, that's not what this is about. And then they said, no, you cannot host this show with The Rock. And I said, okay. And then I went back to my team. I said, so let's put in my notice. And they were like, Carrie, we just signed the contract. I had just signed a contract in October. And I was like, no, it's okay. It's fine. Let's put in my notice. We need to give them however many days or months or whatever. Um, I, I mean... The <laughs> I remember my agent called me and then called me back and then called me again. I was like, I'm still, my mind is made up. <laughs> so, you know, she just want to make sure mm -hmm. that I want to do it. And I remember there were conversations and more conversations and I didn't tell that many people. And my, our friend to the right got so mad at me. He was like, it says here that you consulted <laughs> with good friends before you made this decision. He was like, I consider myself a good friend. I didn't tell that many people. I told maybe two well, you people. you wouldn't tell them anyway, because he told you, yeah, whatever I, you want to do. He's lying. He told me to have I gave a- her great he, advice. He gave me some weed toast. Nope. Yeah, you did. And so, but, I told you, I yeah. said, the thing I love about you and Jamel is that y'all are not acting like ESPN is the end all be all. Sure. And y'all believe in yourselves enough to step out and be great because y'all are. Thank you. That's you did what say I that said. after the fact. That's not generic. After the fact. You got that from a whole That was yeah, after the fact. fact. <laughs> that was not after the fact. It was after no, the it fact. Wasn't. You it were was. still working on sports center then. My I, goodness. So I'm not gonna fight you. But I left <laughs> because it was time. It was time. And I and I look, I say this to anybody. I did it scared. I'm not sitting up here telling you I thought I was the baddest in the world and I was gonna win and I and I had a plan. I had a couple of opportunities that were in the works. 
but I didn't have a plan plan in the sense of I'm jumping here to go here directly. I knew that I was going to be doing the Olympics. It got postponed. I knew that I would be doing the show with The Rock, you know, whatever. I knew that I had some other things coming down the pike that would ultimately lead to bigger and better, but I did it scared. And the reason why I did it scared is because I had to have faith in God. Like, my God had to protect me. I was like, I'm going to be all right. That's right. I, like, I, that's it. Like, I'm going to be fine. And I say that to people because when you start working for yourself, you that's the biggest hustle ever. Like, you, like it's a different type of hustle when you are the brand, when everything's about you. Like, you are bringing in the money. You are hiring the employees. You become your own businesswoman. Like, and I remember Jay saying to me, girl, I remember she said, you probably going to leave and get 20 more jobs, kind of similar to what I'm doing. But it wasn't even so much about 20 more jobs. It was really about controlling um, the narrative that I wanted to put in the universe and what I wanted to share with people. Uh, Right at the time that I left, January 31st, my last few days, I covered Kobe. It was the hardest decision I ever made. In my mind, I'm like, damn, am I messing up? Should I stay? I'm like, stories like this? How am I going to cover stories like this? This is like, this is a big story. And then I just remember just vacillating, going back and forth. And then in February, I was in Atlanta shooting. And then the world shut down in March. And then it made perfect sense. Like, it made perfect sense. Like, then everything, when I tell you from Breonna Taylor to George Floyd to Maude mm-hmm. Aubrey, there's no way I could have been speaking so freely um, about those those heartbreaking murders if I was there. I would have felt, I would have felt trapped. I would have felt as if I would have been in trouble if I would have been tweeting something that I wasn't supposed to tweet. Mm-hmm. There were all these restrictions where I did not feel safe. And my spirit would have been so uneasy. So it was, not only was it the right decision, it was the best decision. Uh, I ultimately then get a show with one of my best friends. How's that ever, like right. the beauty. Stick you, to sports. Like how do you get to work with your best friend? Mm-hmm. And then, And then I get to do a podcast with another one of my close friends who be on some mayonnaise sometimes, but I still fool with them. You know what I mean? Who's that? And, <laughs> Charlemagne. Have oh, you met sure him? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> this is disrespectful. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Y'all gotta stop disrespect short shaming. Why y'all short shaming? <laughs> the y'all short tall. guy. So you have the naked. So what, what's the naked? Just exactly what we've been doing. Just talking about. Just I'm figuring it out. Great marketing too, though. Cause you know guys like you, so when they see Carrie Champion naked, they like, oh. I, you know what? So this next podcast, this next episode, Jamel and I are naked. We did it naked. What do you mean? We're naked. We were, we're having. We did the entire podcast with no clothes on. Oh, ain't no video though. Yeah, it is. I mean, you just get to see this part. Oh, okay, okay, oh, okay. Yeah. What was the point of that? What? What? <laughs> What's the point of that? I mean, I know. I mean, I understand the podcast is naked. I we know just what the podcast is about, but be comfortable. Okay. I'm kidding, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell them, tell them about the I'm podcast. Kidding. I, I really enjoyed it. But I love the way you produce it. I tell you that because it's not like um, it's interesting how you put together the conversations because it's almost like you're narrating their conversation. Right. Yeah. I didn't, so didn't want a Q and A, so I everyone. I, sometimes we do Q and A. Q and A is great. I love that because you need the back and forth. But I really wanted the person to tell their stories. Like I want to tell the facts. You grew up here. You're ten years old. This happened to you when you're ten. But then I want you to tell the point of what happened. So recently, we had Busy Phillips on. You guys know Busy Phillips? Yeah, white girl. Right. <laughs> she is. Um, she was on Cougar Town YouTube. Do you ever see movie? You you remember White Chicks? Yeah. She was like she was White Chick and White Chicks, mm-hmm. um, and she has a new show out. But she is um, one of these one of these white women that I fool with heavy because I I literally I fool with her heavy because I literally have had such issues with white women, especially in the workspace. And I remember telling her about this when we first became friends, and she just schooled me on how white women are socialized and how they move in a workspace. And and the reason why I find it so difficult. She's like, I get it. She was like, we're sneaky. She was like, we're sneaky to sneakies. We cry when we want our way. We are, we do things that we know are manipulative because we can get away with it. She was just breaking it all down for me. And she was like, and we're socialized different. Oh, they're going to vi- kick her out of the crew. Again, no, they're not. They're <laughs> <laughs> she's giving away all them white women secrets. They're going to no, kick her not. out. Well, but then, you know, then she talked about having an abortion when she was 15 years old. She talked about being raped when she was 14. Like, she's just, those, those are the topics. And those are uncomfortable topics. And don't nobody want to talk about it. But she went there. And I appreciate that because... We're all just trying to make our way home. They're, everybody's dealing with something. You dealing with something. Envy's dealing with something. We're all dealing with something. And mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it would be nice to know that we're not alone. And it would be nice to know that I can still be successful. It would be nice to know that no matter how many times I fall, I can get back up and still win at life. And that's what I hope this podcast is giving to people. Um, I hope you're inspired. I hope you're mad. I hope you're angry. I hope you cry. I hope you everything. But the reality is at the end of the day, 
I think social media has lied to everybody. Everybody Absolutely. is out here fake winning. Mm-hmm. If I see another, you know, purse, car, um, money, whatever it is, I'm so annoyed because that's not what, what life is. That's not the real hustle, right? Mm-hmm. The hustle is really trying to get our hearts right. We're really mm-hmm. trying to take care of our own. And be happy. Yeah. And be happy. That's the real hustle. Mm-hmm. And 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 finding it is difficult as hell. Mm-hmm. And and I'm trying to find it. So I'm I'm and so I'm I'm sharing very uncomfortable things. Like I because you know what your secrets have power. And so I'm trying to release some of this power and give it away. Well make sure y'all subscribe to uh the Naked Podcast yes, on the Black Effect iHeartRadio Podcast you. Network. And, and what about Stick to Sports with Jamel? Oh, that's my favorite show. Y'all should watch it. It's so you can get the episodes on Hulu now. You can get anywhere. You can download and get them anywhere. It's on Vice. Um, we uh, we wrapped season one, and we had a lot of fun. We were inappropriate. I learned mm-hmm. a lot. We did a lot of things that I could I could walk back. So that's another that's another good show you should watch. And, and I feel like that show was a form of protest. Like you know the whole. We were protesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were protesting because we were fed up. You ever just get so damn fed up with all the all the things? <laughs> as I keep saying, we were fed up with how we've been treated, fed up with how um, the world was treating black people, black women. Uh, we were on. I remember someone's mom sent us a message and said, "They allowing y'all to say this on TV." <laughs> and I was, <laughs> I started laughing. I was like, "Yeah, they are," because because quite frankly. It, it's okay to hear women of color with an opinion mm-hmm. on politics and sports, and they know what the hell they're talking about. You don't have to agree, but we're not just making things up. Jake Paul said y'all was making shit up. No, Jake was mad at us. You know he was mad at us. Yeah, I didn't. You know what's so funny about that too? I think you it's remember a, that? remember the. Mm-hmm. You it remember was, the Jake Paul thing? They were so outraged because Jamel had asked him. And oh, I do remember. remember yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. And then I asked him too. And I remember, I was like, why? They, wh- where's this fake outrage coming from? Is anybody mad that Breonna Taylor was murdered in her home? Mm-hmm. Like, all these white people were on our ass about Joe how was we... was clearly playing them. Clearly joking. Like, it was so obvious that we were joking. But, you know, listen... The way it was edited, mm-hmm. because I don't even try to explain it, the way it came across, I know people were upset about it, but come on, that's not nothing to be upset about. Mm-hmm. Like, honestly. And he uses, like, nobody had even checked his background and figured out what kind of man he was. Like, nobody even cares what kind of, I was just, but they were just mad at us. It wasn't about Jake Paul. Absolutely. They were just, you know, it's not about Jake Paul. It was about us. It was about us up sitting up here real smart, putting subject and predicates together, making money, living real comfortable, and, and taking advantage of it and saying things that they feel are inappropriate. Mm-hmm. We weren't being good Negroes. And so that's what that was about. So this, this is uh, my last question. Give um, it to me. So we know that the Lakers aren't winning this year. So <laughs> you know, I told her they're not making the playoff. So so now that we know the Lakers aren't winning this Don't year, do that to what me. team do you think has the best chance? No, seriously, come on. Is that what we're doing right now? Hmm? Are we? I thought, no, I kept looking at you thinking we were bonding. We are. We, but I, I thought you, you also said we got to be real with each other. And if we're going to be real with each other, we understand that the Lakers are not going to make it this year. So I'm just curious to what other team that They you... might not make the playoffs, Carrie. I told you this. They might not. Okay. Clippers? So, <laughs> so first of all, I want to say Knicks. thank you guys for having me on. Right? That's the first thing. <laughs> I respect you guys. I respect Angela. I respect all that you do. You are the voice of the culture. And very influential. And I hope you understand your power. And I hope you use it for good. Because that is the truth. Okay? So I want to get that out of the way first. Mm-hmm. But that question you asked me was so fucking disrespectful, Wendy. <laughs> Why? Why? <Yeah. laughs> you ain't answered it, though. Because you Listen, know what your heart is telling you. My heart is telling me we in trouble. But I don't like to talk about it. Because a real fan doesn't say, listen, this is what I do think. I do think this. If we make it to the playoffs, as you say, you think we may not. If we do make it to the playoffs, I think a different... And everyone's concerned about LeBron. You have to understand, they only tell you what you need to know. I think LeBron kicks into a different mode mm-hmm. when it's when it's playoff. He knows how to take care of himself on a different level. He knows how to play. They know how to manage all of that. All we have to do is get in, Right. Now, whether we win it all, I can't I can't guarantee that. I would love that. I mean, I thought we would. But you know, first of all, you what and here comes my excuses. This season was bull because why? Because they did not have any rest. They win the chip, right? They take it all the way to they take it all the way to October. Then they go right back to work less than a month, a month and some change later in terms of of resting up and then start pre pre camp, pre training. Then they go, then they go to all-Star Weekend, when they weren't supposed to have an All-Star Weekend, Mm -hmm. there's been no break. LeBron is an older gentleman. There has been no time for them to have to sit and recoup and relax. 
And this is why their bodies are breaking down. And so this season shouldn't even count. And I'm going to throw this season out with the bathwater. Well, the Lakers are a prime example of why they say, barring injury, this team will, nobody will beat this team. But they've had two injuries today. So you think, the, players. wait, let me say, so you think the Nets are a, a legitimate team? And that they're going no, to go out there and win. Why, why you don't think they're a legitimate team? I th- I feel like I I honestly feel like why, again when the playoffs come around, that's when you really understand who people are. Mm-hmm. Remember we just talked about a team, the teamwork, the team, the aspect of working with people, liking Correct. people, I agree. not liking people. I think complete teams beat great talents. That's it. I really believe that. I think the Pistons showed that when they beat the Lakers. Uh, what year was that? Uh, Nine. No, 2004. Four? Yeah, yeah, 2004. Yeah. I mean, because the Lakers had all the talent, but the Pistons were a better team. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And, what, and, what better and when team they beat, beat them, remember they beat them Brooklyn. in the finals? If remember everybody that? in Brooklyn's healthy. I do remember that. What better team could beat Brooklyn? I, you guys, I got to tell you, I, if I'm honest with you, I always think that the I, I think the East has always been, that's why everybody runs to the East. I still think, I still think the Bucks are amazing. I guess. Sixes. Mm-hmm. I still think the Sixers. I don't think they're going to win, but I think the Sixers are good. But the Bucks, to me, I think they're. I mean, I th- I think we're giving Giannis a hard time mm-hmm. because we do expect a lot out of him, right, as the MVP. But I think, I honestly think that the Bucks are something special. I'm still leaning on them, and I think that they'll do well. I don't. I don't believe the hype. I'm not a believer. It's a clip, you, the Clippers. I mean, excuse me. The 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 Nets remind me of the Clippers. Do you remember when it was? Lob City, this Lob yeah. City, that, and then and then you get and then last year everybody was like they about to do it, they about to do, it. they were a disaster, and they had all that talent. In seven game series, but not this different. talent. This talent is unbelievable. I don't, I don't. I don't this talent is. I'm waiting to see. That's all. I'm Kyrie, waiting to see. Harvey. I'm not a believer. Oh, of who? The Nets. Not I'm in the seven game series against a great team. I just don't know. I. It's not even so much about the talent. It's about them just being cohesive and being able to to get along. And who 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 want it? Like everybody want the ball, right? Like I don't, I just, don't, I they probably are going to be amazing. I get that's why I'm gonna throw it out here because people saying I'm being a hater, and it probably a little bit of it is me being a hater. But I just don't know how mentally those guys will get along when it it comes time to actually play in a seven game series, and they and everybody want to be a superstar. Everybody want to win. Everybody want to have the ball in their hands. They want to make that last second shot. Like they have to really be like, all right, man, it's you. You got it. You got it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if they can do I think Kyrie maybe. I mean, who knows? I don't know. I, I, yeah. I'm really, I just. You just I'm know not, it's not going to be the Lakers. So that's why you're a little confused. <laughs> that's why you sound like you're reporting on somebody that drowned. <laughs> you just don't know how to say if the Lakers it. are dead. You just don't know how to say it. Okay, <laughs> that's it. They um they went to heaven and <laughs> they um they so they passed on they they passed along um to greener pastures, right. greener pastures. Um. <laughs> well, Carrie, I'm 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 proud of you as yeah. always. Oh, I love you. And um, I'm glad you. Stepped off the boat to walk on water. Amen. Which Should've is something I told. I did say that. No, that before. he didn't know. I did say he that. He didn't know. He didn't know. Envy. Envy. You know how he do. I said you know him this. better. You but not to, after I did it. African American. After I did it. You didn't say it before. I did. You did not. You was him and Han. That's why I turned off my phone and I did it scared because <laughs> I didn't need nobody to put their fears. But on we didn't me. know what was going. We didn't know what the future held. But I told you that you're gonna be great. I knew that. I listen. I never had a doubt, and it wasn't about being successful. I had already been successful. Me right. sitting there Monday through mm-hmm. Friday was revolutionary. I had been a success. It was what I was going to do in this next level of success. That's yeah. right. Well, I can't wait to see what else you do. That's Thank right. you. I so. appreciate you guys both. Seriously, Envy, I was kidding. Just don't talk about my Lakers like that. That was rude. I'm just joking. So make sure y'all check out the Naked Podcast yes. on the Black Effect iHeartRadio Podcast Network. Go watch us uh, stick to sports on Hulu. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. It's on Vice TV though, but we can you can get uh, our older episodes on Hulu now. Now what's that show with that guy? The I guy also with do the a show. Guy I, with the what? I also I'm not answering him. You I also what? I do a show on TNT called The Arena, which is coming back. Oh in yeah, June. that one. I know that one, June. but not the other one. Isn't that, what's the guy name? The guy with the titties? Yeah, y'all know who the guy that used to be a wrestler. You don't, sent us some tequila. Don't, don't do it. The don't, Rock. Don't there listen. you go. No, don't encourage him. <laughs> don't encourage him. Don't. That's why I just. I'm not. <laughs> well, Carrie, we appreciate you. For Thank you. Us. Yes, Carrie Champion. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you.